Well, welcome everybody to the latest edition of uh, Power Ups webinar series. Um, tonight, Coach Ashley uh, will be discussing weight training for cyclists and uh, demonstrating some of the exercises she feels are important to any cyclist's off-season weight training program. Ashley is not only a coach at Power Up, but she's also a personal trainer. She is a BS in exercise physiology and an MS in human, form human performance with an emphasis in exercise physiology. She's a Cat One racer, a former uh, Texas State Criterium champion, two-time Missouri State Criterium champion, and bronze medalist at the U.S. Collegiate National Championships. Um, so Ashley, it's your show. Okay, um, hello everyone. So for those of you who watch my last webinar this is just basically a just a deeper dive into um, cycling specific weight training exercises um, just kind of run down all my information same slide from last time um, my experience then we'll go so topic of discussion is just a deeper dive into what we discussed during my lap my laps my laps, laps I encourage you guys to go to uh, the Power Ups YouTube channel um, and watch it there and see what you've missed. Um, so the main thing that we're going to talk today is exercise selection and which exercises that I feel that are very beneficial but it's not limited to these. Um, so basically what is exercise se selection? simple selecting the exercises you will be performing for your exercise program nothing tricky there um so this is the same side from my last presentation just kind of wanted to go through it really quick just to refresh your guys's memory so exercise selection so some considerations um you want to think about what available equipment you have um and listed several there um how many days per week or amount of time you'll be limited to your, um, your workout? And then what are your training goals? A little bit more. Um, so you want to look at the sport specific movements within cycling or your sport. And then also the non-specific movements. Um, you need to determine your core or your main exercise. So that focus of whatever that workout is. And then your assistance exercises, then structural versus power exercises. Um, like I said last time, you generally want to keep a workout to about five to eight exercises. If you get to too many, especially when you're in like a strength range focus um, or strength focus workout, you're going to be spending anywhere to like five minutes rest between each exercise. So that's going to take up a lot of time. Uh, so you definitely want to be conscious about how many exercises you're either plugging into your own workout or your athlete's workouts. Um, and then always think about every exercise is a core, so for your trunk exercise. Um, and over to the right, I kind of displayed a, um, what muscles are being recruited during or throughout the phase of a pedal, a stroke for cyclists. Um, so you can see we get a lot of glute and then into quad during the power phase, go into the uh, quads, but you have the anterior tibialis in the blue. The yellow is the hamstrings and the greens are the hip flexors. So those are primarily the muscles that we will be focusing on. Um, and then just a little note, um, even though you do recruit your posterior muscles, so like your glutes and hamstrings, uh, during the pedal stroke, a lot of cyclists do have weak posteriors, which can be harmful later on. Um, so as a cyclist, what exercises should I do? So these are just the tip of the iceberg. We have squats, deadlifts, leg presses, leg curls, leg extensions, hang cleans, and you can kind of just go down from there. You have some upper body, lower body, core mix in there. Um, and some of these exercises, we will be going through during this presentation. Okay, so 
Ideally today, I would like to discuss on some exercises or styles of training that you may not be familiar with and something, some exercises that I see people do wrong all the time. Um, and then have this meme, I don't always go to the gym, but when I do, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Uh, that's pretty funny. Okay, so for your core lifts, so stuff like the leg press, the deadlifts, squats, stuff like that, that is a multi-joint, multi-muscular movement. Um, you can do what's called e eccentrics and negatives. So today I'll we'll start off with going a little bit into that. So what is an eccentric lift? So it's just the elongated, uh, elongated the time spent in the eccentric, so lowering portion of the exercise and then you perform the exercise as normal. So if you look on kind of a program, you'll see this six um, zero zero, and that just means that the eccentric portion, that six, is seconds. So you're gonna spend six seconds lowering, and then you're not gonna spend hardly any time in the isometric phase of an exercise, and then you're gonna come up as quick as possible in the concentric. And so an example like this is simple, we'll use a squat. So have whatever weight or load, or it could just be a body weight squat, lowering down to the bottom of your squat, you're gonna take six seconds. So it's gonna be a really slow uh, lowering phase. But then the rest of it is just gonna be just like normal, you're gonna to wanna to be explosive, get up as quickly as possible, then you're gonna go right back into that six seconds lowering phase. Now a negative lift is same in the beginning where you only perform the elongated eccentric portion of the lift. Um, and then, so you only perform that portion. And then you ha either have a partner grab the weight and unload you so you don't have to perform the isometric and concentric, or you have some kind of setup where you do not perform those muscle contractions. Um, a lot of people get these two styles very confused and they are very similar there it's just the concentric and isometric portions is the difference um, and then little bird over there about being eccentric okay so why do we do eccentric and negatives so uh with an eccentric muscle movement the muscles are able to generate much more forces than when compared to an, a concentric and isometric portion of the exercise. So you're really limited by the amount of weight you can do because of the concentric and isometric portions. So this is why this new, it's not new, this different style of training um, has existed is to be able to emphasize that and um, so yeah, so the two physiological pr processes of force development. So you have your stretch reflex and then you have your stretch shortening cycle. I'm gonna not spend too much time on this because this is a lot of like physiology. Um, so you have your Golgi tendon organ, which is a neuromuscular inhibitor within the muscle. And then you have your muscle spindles, which is a neuromuscular stimulator. stimulator. So with the Golgi tendon organ, it causes the muscles to relax to avoid injury, um, which is really terrible for developmental uh, explosive power. And as an athlete, you want to be explosive, uh, explosive as possible. Um, Cal, Cal Dietz, who's a really well-known strength conditioning coach in the U.S., um, who now works for the um, U.S. hockey team, he uh, explains the Golgi tendon organ as an overprotective mother. Um, and kind of an example of this is you hear about those incredible acts of strength where a mother will like lift a car up. And it's because this Golgi tendon organ is, it gets turned off by the brain. Um, they don't really quite know what happens or like why it does it, but it just does. Um, and then another part of the stretch reflex is you have your muscle spindles, which is a neuromuscular stimulator. 
So it's basically just sends the brain or uh, info to the brain on how heavy the force is and how far to contract the muscle to overcome the load. Um, and then we'll next portion of this is a stretch shortening cycle. And so it's basically just the absorption of kinetic energy within the muscle and tendons. And so when the muscles and tendons are stretched, it stores elast uh, elastic, elastic energy. And then during a concentric phase, it is used, um, which all comes into the rate of force development. So let's get into what these act exercises actually look like. So this right here is a negative with a leg press with a tempo of six seconds lowering. And then you're basically just pushing it up as quickly as possible. Well. Or actually, John uh, in this video is actually taking the weight off. So I'll play it, you can see. So I'm lowering it, trying to go as slow as possible. And then he's pushing it up. Then I'm going right back into that lowering phase. One more time. Okay. Um, one thing I have found with the negative leg presses, and as long as you have somebody who's there to actually help push it up for you, to take off, um, to unload you of that concentric and isometric contraction, is you can really load the place up on this. Um, so I would say start cautiously, but you don't have to be so cautious that you're not getting the most benefit out of it. Oh, wait. Okay. Then now we have a eccentric barbell back squat. So with a tempo of five seconds lowering and then coming up as quickly as possible with the back squat, if you're doing any kind of eccentric work with it, you always need a squatter. Um, and you can see I have the safety bars on. I am facing the hooks that the barbell is hold uh, in. And then I go stand underneath the bar. I stand up. I take one, two steps back because I don't want to waste as much energy. I want to conserve that energy. Then I'm slowly lowering, keeping it controlled. And then right here, I try to come up as fast as possible. And then go straight back into it. And one more time. Here's John spotting me. This is how you spot somebody. It should be underneath the armpits and then back up. Now with heavy weight, with the barbell back squat, eccentrically, you may not be able to come up as quick as possible, but the fact that you just want to think or just basically tell yourself that you're trying to explode up as much as possible because the brain will start connecting um, and making those neuro, uh, motor neuron units that it needs to make you explosive. And so it's just progress with that. And then the eccentric barbell deadlift. You come down, grab the weight. This one, you do not need a spotter. Come up quickly and then slowly lower. Down, come up. So this one is a little bit reversed as far as um, most exercises, you'll see the beginning movement as the eccentric, whereas um, the deadlift is reverse. Any questions on eccentrics and negatives? I'll take that up. Huh? Uh, Ashley? Uh, Ashley? Yes. Um, in regards to um, eccentrics um, mm -hmm. exercises, do you ever do concentric exercises um, prior to eccentric exercises? Like, uh, as an example, would you would you do a set where you would do um, on the hip sled um, concentric exercises to failure, and then have somebody um, help you do eccentrics to failure? Um, I mean, it really depends on what goal you're trying to get out. Um, and, I, and I think that's something that the coach 
would know exactly like when to program because you can absolutely do something like that. Um, but yeah, it really just depends on what your training goal is. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of like an example. Um, I mean, something like that where you're doing that much in it volume, I would probably do that something more like early on in the strength phase. That's something I wouldn't do closer to the start of the season because something like that, I feel like you'd get a lot of hypertrophy and a lot of volume in the legs. Um, so that's something I would definitely do earlier in the off season, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, um, so next we're going to go into like some lower posterior exercises. Like I said earlier, a lot of cyclists have weak posteriors, even though you do recruit hamstrings and glutes. Um, it's just not to the extent. And then when you add on top of it, sitting down all day, like at a desk or a computer, you're just worsening the, um, the issues and the weaknesses. So, one of, my first, one of my most favorite ones is the barbell hip thrust. Um, so this is good for um, glutes, <clears throat> hamstrings, and then also you work a little bit on producing power with the hips in this one. <clears throat> so you can see I have just a barbell across the hips. My torso is nice and straight and I'm hinging up, holding, bringing it back down, you want to keep it controlled. Um, the biggest thing I would like to put a, pull, point out is that from the head to your hips, you want to keep in one straight line. A lot of people will like sag their torsos and not keep their core engaged. And like I said earlier, you want to use every exercise as a core exercise. Um, and so as I'm coming up, my head is in line with my body. So I'm keeping that neutral spine. Um, make sure feet are completely planted on the floor and that you are on a good stable surface. Um, I've been on sometimes with uh, benches that don't have a great surface and tend to rock a little bit. Um, so example like that down on the side furthest away from the camera, I would put weights like plated, uh, weighted plates on that to keep it a bit more stable. Um, first things first with any exercise is safety. Next one is another one of my most favorite ones. Um, so a Romanian deadlift or an RDL. So main thing you want to do is you want to keep the bar as close to your legs as possible. You want to keep a nice flat back and your core engaged the whole entire time. And so we're going to start up in a standing position. You're going to lower it down, bring it back up, squeeze the glutes, nice tight core, keeping your feet planted, feet about hip width apart. And you just want a slight bend in the knee. Too many people like to squat down or dead, do more of a deadlift. And this is really, um, you really just want to focus more on the hips and it being a hip movement. So good, uh, good cue for this one is shoving your hips back. So you kind of want to reposition that weight more on those heels and that you're shoving your hips back for the movement. Watch a few more times and then back up and you can even make this one. This is a really good one to make eccentric. So slowly lowering down and then exploding back up. That's one I like to do a lot. Next one is a kettlebell swing. This is another one I see way too many people not really grasping the concept. Um, so first I will show you guys the video and then we will talk through it. So the kettlebell swing is a good core and hip power movement. I see a lot of people turn this into like a squat row kind of thing. So they will actually squat down and then use their arms and muscle the weight up. And if you see, 
my arms are not really doing too much work. They are just acting like a link between my hips, my core, and the kettlebell. So after a kettlebell swing, if your arms are tired, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, you want to ideally have a generally wide stance and um, keep the core engaged. Can you guys see my cursor? Yes. Okay, perfect. So and ideally, as you're doing this swing, you want to act like you're drawing a triangle from your knees up and you want that kettlebell to come in between and even sometimes tap you on the rear end. Um, that's how you know you're bringing the kettlebell in a good position. Um, like I said, really good for generating power and strengthen your, strengthening your core. Okay, so unilateral exercises. As an athlete, you, you need to be doing unilateral ex exercises. When you pedal, you don't pedal with both feet. Same time you pedal with one and then the other. Um, and so, and with any other sport as well. So a few of my favorite ones. Um, so some of these did not actually upload, having technical difficulties. So I will have to go to Dropbox for this one. Um, so the single leg squat, and I like to do the heel drop one because it kind of gets your body into a better position and more similar to how it would be on the bike. Let me see if I can find it real quick. And then, so you can see, I'm lowering my foot, squatting back up, down, and then back up. Ideally, you want to be on a stable box. With this box not being the greatest stable area, I put a, ke uh, a heavy kettlebell on the other side to balance out so I don't tip over because you want to be by the edge. You can also use weighted plates stacked on top of each other or one of the um, exercise boxes that you see in like group fitness exercises. The main thing with this one is as you're lowering down, you want your hip, knee, and foot to be in a line. A lot of people will tend to twist and their knee will become valgus, so that knee will cave in. And we really want to stray away from that and keep everything in a good line. Let's see, go back. Next we have single leg RDLs. So this one really reminds me of like the drinking bird back a little bit before my time. Um, and so you really want to act like you're in one straight line and you're hinging on one foot. So this is a side view as you come down, be stable. And the main thing is right here, you want your hip to be facing the ground. You do not want to be opening up, rotating. You want to keep everything nice and parallel to the ground. Um, so as your chest comes down, your foot should come up and be in line. Um, I choose to use a kettlebell on the opposite side to get a little bit more core work. And I like that a lot. And then this is from the front view. Down here, you can see I'm lowering. You want to grab the ground with your toes. Back down, balance. Really good for stability, balance, uh, your posterior exercises, working unilateral. Um, so this is a really good exercise overall. And then next we have a rear elevated split squat or also known as a Bulgarian split squat. Oh wait, wrong one. And so this one, oh, here we go.
So right here for the setup, hold on, where's the pause? So for the setup, you want to have a slightly elevated box or plate or something in the back to get that rear foot up. And then you can either do like a kettlebell, a barbell, dumbbells, whatever you got really works. Um, and with this one, you want majority of that pressure or majority of the work being produced by that front leg. That back leg there is there for support and it will do a little bit of work. Um, but we really want to pay attention to that front leg. And then with this one, just like with a single leg squat, we want to make sure that the knees and toes stay in line. We don't want to see any knee tape, which I see a lot of. And then with the hip, um, I see a lot of hip opening with this one. And you want to make sure your hips, both hips are parallel to the wall or facing the wall in front of you. So we want to make sure that we stay all squared. And next. We have a more advanced exercise. This is something I would put into, into like someone who's been doing strength training for a little bit. Um, it is good kind of time saver. You get a two for one exercise. And so with this one, we're going to go into a rear lunge with light barbell into a box step up, working on balance, working on unilateral movements, working core, getting a lot of bang for our buck right here. Working on trying to transition from one movement into the another. Um, since this is a more complex workout, it, it challenges the athlete, um, which can work in our favor. What did I just do? Okay, there we go. Okay, so next is one of my favorites, um, plyometrics exercises. And Jen, I kind of was kind of talking about Jim. Uh, to Jim this er earlier. It's like, I'll let you know, no, I did plyometrics and cried only for two hours afterwards. Um, if anyone has done plyometrics properly, they know exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, so plyometrics, it is much more than just jump training. Um, so basically, what plyometrics is, is exercises that force a muscle to reach max force in the least amount of time. So yay power. Um, so this is done by mechanical and neurophysiological increases in power. Um, so the type of plyo drills you may see. So we'll go from beginner, easy basics to more the advanced plyos. So you have jumps in place, standing jumps, um, plyos that are multiple jumps or hops bounds, box drills, and then depth jumps being the most advanced. And by most advanced, I mean the hardest on the body. It may not necessarily be that difficult or look that difficult. Um, and then, so me during my plyometrics workout, I bet I could jump over that mountain. It's how I always feel and then I look at the video and I'm not getting very high. <laughs> Okay, so some considerations with plyometrics that you do. So you want to think about, so in terms of masters athletes, you want to think about their joint health. If they are a healthy masters athlete, has never had any joint issues, does not have um, arthritis or anything like that, then they sh should be no issue with them being uh, doing plyometrics. If they do have arthritis, um, if they've had any like knee replacement, hip joint replacements, um, then it's something you may want to start out easy and lower in volume and just gradually progress um, with that. And then next is the, athl the athlete's level of strength. So plyometrics are really hard on the body and you cannot just go jump in and doing plyometrics and not have done 
any basic strength training beforehand. Um, so you really need to prime the muscles and get them ready to experience the forces that you're going to be exerting on the body. Um, I need to think about technique. If you have a beginner in the gym, um, they just started strength training this year, they may not have the best technique. Um, a lot of bad techniques I see in piles is whenever they land or they take off for the jump, their knees cave in. Um, and so with that, with the beginner, you wanna start them more in the basics and then gradually progress. Um, balance is another issue. Um, if you're doing a lot of like single leg hops, how's their balance? Are they falling over every time? If they are, maybe do double leg um, plyos because if they're falling over, they're not really getting any benefit from that. Um, an athlete's weight, if, you're, if you are about 220 pounds or above, you may need to require some adjustments. And this is just in terms of like the athlete's joints, um, may need to be more of that beginner or easier plyo. Um, and it's just in regards to the, the amount of force that you're exerting on the um, athlete's joints to protect those. Um, Next, we want to think about the facilities and equipment. So you want to think about the landing services, hard versus soft. Too hard means not enough, you're not going to have enough shock absorption and you're, going to, you're really going to feel it. Um, too so soft increases the amortization phase. And so this is like that pause phase um, in a uh, plyometric. So example is whenever you're going to jump. So say if we're doing a basic box jump, we're going into the eccentric phase or we're doing like a counter movement jump and then there's a pause and then you jump. We want to make that as quick as possible um, just so we can keep that rate of force development up and we can really train that. So box for boxes, you want generally a height of six, to, anywhere from six to 42 inches. So you have a pretty good range in there. Um, you want to make sure you have like a non-slip surface for footwear. You want to make sure it has good foot and ankle support. Um, and then some special notes on depth jumps. Like I said, these are the more advanced. They are, generate a lot of force and um, can be hard on the body. So a box height is 16 to 42 inches. Um, beginners should start a about 16 to 20 inches um, normal for most athletes or about 30 to 32. But if you're, like I said, if you're a beginner you may, or you're just starting plyos for the first time for the season, start out at the lower box and gradually work your way up. Um, and then for athletes who are over 220 pounds, they should use no higher than an 18 inch uh, box. And did not, I was not able to get a depth jump video but basically what that is, is you're standing on a box, you step off, and as soon as you hit the ground, you jump up. So it's a very quick jump up um, exercise. And then you, once you do that, then you go back on the box and then you step off. And as soon as you hit the ground, you explode up again. Okay, so the video to my left is a plyo box jump. So down, I jump down, I'm quickly on the ground, and then I'm jumping back up. So you really want to try to minimize the amount of time you spend, you spend on the ground before you jump. And this right here is not a plyo box jump. So I jump up and then I step down. So these are to two totally different exercises, even though they look very similar. Um, so this is more the not plyo box jump is more like jump training or you're just really focusing on the um, producing as much force as possible, whereas the plyo is producing as much force as possible repeatedly, if that makes sense. Okay. 
Next, we have a cycled split squat box jump. So this is something I would probably program as an athlete's uh, training program that starts a little closer to the season. Um, it's more similar. It mimics um, the mimics cycling a little bit more. So you have right here, you want to quickly switch between legs. This is a bit more of an advanced. Um, I probably should have been a little bit more on the box with my foot, just so I have a good, uh, solid um, base. And then, so next we're gonna go into some postural exercises. Um, as you can see with Mark Cavendish, this is how a lot of cyclists look and they're bent over the muscles in the back become very elongated and you can develop some really bad spinal issues if these are not addressed. So some of the good ones, so we'll, uh, one of the really good ones is, I did not want to pause to start that yet. So it's a YTWL exercise and I will take this video one at a time because it's basically four exercises and one rotation. Um, so two different ways you can do this is you can do it on a stability ball, which is probably a more, it, which is a more advanced movement. So you really have to have a good core to be able to do this. Whereas maybe a beginner um, would look over here on the right. So they're on a stable surface. So it's like a bench about 45 degree angle. Um, generally for this, and especially for cyclists, do not want to do anything more than five pounds. Um, otherwise you're going to destroy your shoulders. Um, even in, as an example, whenever I was a strength conditioning coach for the football team, they weren't allowed to lift more than five pounds for these exercises. Um, so as a cyclist really have no, uh, no, uh, reason to be lifting more than that. And so this is really just working on, um, scapular stabilization and the um, just strengthening the muscles near the scapula and then also the rotator cuff. So with this one we're going to start with the Y and so I'm on the stability ball so right there I activated those shoulder blades and then I'm going to move my arms up to make a Y. So you're really just spelling out these letters with your body and then I hold it, bring it back down, I relax, then I make sure I really get that scapular contraction in, back down. And then from there, once you do however many reps you're supposed to do, we will go to the T exercise. And then you just come out to the T. With this one, you can still see I activated the scapulas before I even started moving. And then from there, we will go to the W. So with this, or hold on, wrong one. This is the, yeah, the L, so we'll discuss this one. You don't necessarily have to do any of these in one order. So right here, I drag those elbows up, I activate the scapulas, and then I rotate. Let's watch that one again. I bring those elbows up, keep the core engaged, and then back down. Oh, hold on. I guess the W did not get involved in this one, so just one second. So this right here, this is how you want to start with the elbows bent so that whenever you come up and you're activating the muscles in the back, you're creating a W with your body. And you really just want to focus on that muscle contraction right there, pause, squeeze, and then bring it back down. And so this is all really going to strengthen the muscles in the back. 
and allow us for good posture. Next one is Jim. How do you pronounce this? The I pronounce Bruger. it. I pronounce it Bruger. I don't know if that's okay. correct. But... <laughs> how I pronounce it, but I, as a Texan, I just make my own pronunciations. This one is. I guess there's two. So you want to make sure you come to the edge of the chair so that you have to sit up nice and tall. You want to keep the core activated. I have this with the band and you're going to basically bring out, bring the chest forward and really squeeze the uh, scapulas in the back. Relax. And then come out, squeeze again. And then one more time. And so with these ones, you can do so many different variations. You can pause however many seconds you want at the back, um, which is nice. And so you can progress without having to add weight or anything like that. And then another one, um, this one is, I probably have come across it in the past year. It's a prone angel. Another one where you activate the muscles in the back. So with this one, you're gonna re lay relax on the ground. You're going to engage the core of the low back and scapulas. And you're going to come up into that W shape and then reach up overhead and then bring it back down and then relax, come up. And as you're moving, oh, hold on. And as you're moving, you want to think about the scapula, like the scapular motion. As you're coming up, it's winging out and you're coming back, you're engaging it and then back down and relax. Watch this one again, or and reach out. Pause. Okay, and then next one. So some core exercises. As a as, cyclist, actually, I'm sorry. Before before we we move on to the core exercises, those last three uh, exercises, I think I personally think are very important for cyclists um, and people who sit at a computer all day. Uh, because you tend to to end up stooping over, um, mm -hmm. and uh, unfortunately, um, the sitting at a computer all day compounds the <laughs> what happens when you're cycling. And, oh, yeah. and those exercise in terms of returning your posture to a more upright position um, are really really important. Like if I were personally. If I were putting together somebody's plan, uh, training plan, um, and they were uh, in the weight room three days a week, um, I would literally have them do those exercises three days a week. I oh would, yeah. I would switch up. I would switch up everything else. Um, their leg exercises, the core exercises, everything else would get switched up. But those exercises, mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, they're really, really critical. Oh yeah. And there's, there's even some more good ones, which I didn't even post on here, but for like an example is last year I had a bad crash where I landed on my back and completely destroyed it. And, and it just really showed me how much I should have just kept those exercises up because it made my rehab just so much longer, just having the weak muscles in the back, uh, like scapula, especially like with any kind of like scapular movement, it took me months to get back um, to where I could actually move it properly and do the exercises without having any pain. Okay, so next we'll go into core exercises. Um, so as a cyclist, uh, Bent, bent over in, on the bike for a very long time, for sometimes five, six hours a day. 
or well, maybe once a day or once a week or whatever the case is. Um, so yeah, so you need to have a strong core. And so basically your core is from your shoulders down to your abs, your obliques, your low back and around your hips. Um, so basically anything directly immediate to the trunk, to your trunk. So one of my most favorite ones is the dead bug. And the reason I like this one so much is because it's a really good way to teach somebody how to maintain um, uh, the, oh gosh, um, basically maintain uh, core contraction and like that, um, oh my gosh, completely uh, slid away from me. But so while you're like doing a squat or a deadlift or like press, you want to make sure you have your core contracted, but also want to be able to breathe as well. Um, so this is a good way to be able to practice that. So for a basic bed, dead bug, So the biggest thing with this one is you want to make sure you press your low back into the ground. You do not want to have any space between your back and the low ground. And then you're, you can do opposite arm and leg, you can do same arm and leg, um, really just whatever you want. And this is also really good coordination uh, to be able to practice that. So basically you just have one arm and one leg up in the air, the other one's being lowered, and then you reverse that. Um, and then another one, a little step further for that is a stability ball dead bug, which I also really enjoy. Like this full screen, so you can see I'm keeping my low back on the ground. And with the stability ball, it makes it just a little bit harder because the opposite leg and opposite foot is having to apply some resistance to that stability ball. And so it just makes it, turns up the intensity just a little bit. And then next we have Russian twists on stability ball. So there's really two variations that you can do of this. That's the wonderful things with, um, with the exercise field is sometimes you can have one exercise with 10 names and you can have one name with 10 exercises. Um, so that's always really fun. So with this one, uh, we'll say this is the first variation right here. So you just doing a basic Russian twist side to side. Um, main thing is you want to try to keep your back as straight as possible and you're rotating um, around the waist. Uh, so many people, when I see just them doing normal Russian twists without like a stability wall just on the floor and say if they're holding weight, they'll just do the arms and that's not getting the obliques at all. So you really want to make sure you have that rotation. Um, this right here is a more advanced exercise on that. Um, so we're still really getting the obliques. We're rotating arms out in front of you. You can even have like a small weight and then rotate, try to keep balance and stability. And this is a really good um, oblique burn. And then so next we have, so we have two different variations on the stability ball. We have the pike rollout on a stability ball. So you're going to be in a push up position. We're going to have the feet on the ball. You want to make sure that they are stable on the ball. 
Um, and then from here, you're going to use your core. You're going to come up into a pike position. So you're going to get that booty up in the air. This is good for developing core. You got some quad activation in here and also for uh, shoulder stabilization is really good for this one. And then you're gonna slowly come back down into the plank position, come back up and then come back down. And here you wanna really make sure you're not having a saggy belly. You wanna make sure you keep everything nice and straight. You want your glutes to be activated, your quads, your shoulders, your core, or your abs, everything. And then the next one is a stability ball rollout. Um, this is good, kind of like a little variation of a plank, and then you also can get some tricep work in there. Um, so just nice and slow, pause right here, bring it back up. And you basically just, with, actually with both of these exercises, you want to make sure that you can um, keep it controlled is the biggest thing. Actually with really any of these exercises, main thing is keeping yourself controlled um, just so we can reduce the risk of injury. Um, with this stability ball rollout, I have my knees about hip width apart, so I have a good solid base. Um, and then I just, I've done this enough where I feel like I'm pretty confident with having the ball roll out in front of me. Whereas I know whenever I've had this with, um, where I've inter introduced this as a new exercise, it kind of weirds people out a little bit. And so you uh, slowly have to walk out the ball and then bring it back in. Um, but it's a good variation on the plank exercise. And then, so why do we do all this? Why do we spend hours in the gym during the off season throughout the year? Um, and it's basically, we want to develop a rate of force development. So we want to be not only powerful, but explosive, especially as an athlete. So if somebody's starting the sprint, you want to be able to react as quickly as possible. Um, just because you're the strongest person does not necessarily make, or, um, doesn't mean you're going to win. And Jim has said this a lot. At some point, everyone's going to have to sprint. Whether you're in a breakaway um, on a mountain, you're coming to the finish line, you're with a small group, you're still going to have to sprint and pr quickly produce as much power as possible. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I got. Any questions? So I, ha I have one, uh, Ashley, and that is um, in regards to um, like at what point in the season you introduce your in what, let me rephrase it. At what point in your off season do you introduce plyometrics? Um, um, to, I, go ahead. first of all, like they would have to have a solid strength base. So going through the phase of like hypertrophy strength um i would probably start to bring it in into that strength transitioning to power phase so um kind of like a preseason, like a little bit before the start of the season um really for plyometrics because you want to make sure that they have a strong solid base before going into plyometrics and so it really depends on how many cycles plan to do. Um, if that answers the question. Um, yeah. I know it's a wonderful thing with the human body and athletes. There's no clear cut answer. Um, it make things so much easier if there were. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't introduce I wouldn't introduce plyometrics into like your first strength training phase or strength training cycle. I would wait a couple cycles until you feel strong enough. Um, you're able to perform 
all your normal strength exercises without having any issues with the technique. So like example is like with squats, if you're squatting and you're becoming either knee valgus or knee valeris, then that's probably going to transition into your plyometrics. And then that's going to cause a whole nother world of injuries. And so really just making sure that before they even get to that point that they're solid in their strength and techniques within the, your normal realm of basic strength exercises. Um, what are your thoughts on um, in-season strength training? Yeah, um, it really depends on the athlete. I mean, ideally, it would be nice to do some, and it would be more maintenance. You would never really try to build more strength and more power and more whatever in the season because you're racing so much and that's just going to be way too fatiguing it would be more of like a maintenance phase. Um, so stuff that you definitely have done in the past. Um, so, and then also another consideration is the time. The amount of time that if, if it's even reasonable for them to get to the gym. Um, and then if it's not, then maybe you do more like body weight exercises at home. Uh, but in season, ultimately, the first priority is cycling. That's what we do for cyclists. Uh, whether you're racing or you're doing uh, fondos or group rides, that's the primary goal. So you cannot lose sight of that. Um, but if done properly, you can still do it. Um, now, your time spent in the gym is going to be really little. So it's basically just going to be get in, get out. Um, you're not going to be doing anything heavy. Um, so no, like 90% of your one RM kind of thing, like that's completely out of the question. Um, you're going to be doing relatively light weights. If you are still actually doing like strength or like say squatting or deadlifts, um, maybe do, instead of doing squats, maybe do leg presses so you reduce the risk of injury in season because you're already going to be fatigued or you may be some fatigued so that kind of uh, lessens the strain on the nervous system um, and on the muscles um, and so yeah so it, it is doable but it has to be done properly for it to be successful. And then even another like little branch off, off of it. Um, so you can even do it as where it's like your warm up for your bike ride. So like say you're at home and you have all of these like banded exercises for like strength and like maintenance. That could be something that you do and do like some muscle activation before you get on the bike ride or before you like start in um, your workout or your ride for that day. Um, and so, yeah, so that's probably something I would lean more towards. It's probably more manageable for people spend like 15, 20 minutes of like core and basic, um, movements and resistance training. Great. Well, if nobody else has any questions, Ashley, that was awesome. Great, great stuff. And um, if um, to let everybody know, this will be in case you um, want to go over some of this stuff, um, give us a couple days and we'll have this posted on our YouTube channel. Um, and you can go over it in more detail. And um, you can always reach out to Ashley at stltraining at powerupcycling.net if you have if you need any more if you have any more questions or need any more um you know assistance with putting together a program of your own 
Thanks a lot, Ashley. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye.